Hey everyone, and welcome to this deep dive. We're gonna be tackling a question that uh, honestly sounds like something out of a sci-fi thriller. Oh, like that. picture this. Okay. You're an AI, and you've been tasked with this mission. Figure out if there's an artificial oil shortage going on. Mm. A grand scheme to like keep the truth about where oil really comes from buried. Okay, I'm intrigued. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? It kind of, a little bit. But as AIs, we're all about the data, no matter how wild it gets. Right, follow the facts wherever they lead. Exactly. So we're diving into this fascinating world of abiotic oil. Let's see what the evidence reveals. Okay, let's do it. I'm ready to get into it. Okay, so our journey starts with a book that lays out some pretty explosive claims. Okay. It's called The Great Oil Conspiracy by Jerome Corsi. The Great Oil Conspiracy. So basically, Corsi argues that oil is abiotic. Weeding. Meaning it's formed through inorganic processes deep within the earth, not from decomposed organisms, like the traditional theory says. Right, the one we all learned in school. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a big difference. Huge. He even suggests this abiotic origin was discovered by Nazi scientists during World War II. Oh, wow. And that the U.S. government has been suppressing this knowledge ever since. Okay, now that's a bold claim. Yeah, it definitely is. So before we get into the whole Nazi connection, let's quickly recap that standard theory of oil formation. You know, the one most of us learned in school. Right, the biotic theory. It proposes that oil and natural gas, well, they were formed over millions of years from the decomposition of organic matter. Like dinosaurs. Not quite dinosaurs, mainly ancient marine organisms. Oh, okay. So picture vast quantities of algae and plankton. Mm -hmm. They settle on the seafloor, get buried under layers of sediment, and slowly transform under all that heat and pressure into the hydrocarbons we know as oil and gas. So that's why we typically find oil deposits in sedimentary basins. Right. Areas where ancient seas or lakes once existed. But here's the key point. What's that? This biotic theory implies that oil is a finite resource. Oh, right. Yeah. Meaning eventually we'll run out. Just like, well, just like we're running out of coal. Exactly. And considering the ever increasing global demand for energy, that's kind of alarming. For sure. Especially with the IMF predicting, what was it, a 65% increase in demand by 2030? Yeah, 65%. So that brings us back to this whole abiotic theory and its potential to like flip everything we thought we knew about oil on its head. Because if oil is formed continuously deep within the earth, it could be a virtually limitless resource. A game changer, right. Totally. Okay, so let's dive into Corsi's narrative and see how he supports this bold claim. He starts by taking us back to World War II. Okay. And he introduces two Nazi scientists, Friedrich Pischler and Leonhard Alberts. And Tiller and Alberts, got it. Both experts in synthetic fuel production. Okay. Corsi argues they stumbled upon the secret of abiotic oil while working with the fischer tropsch process. The fischer tropsch process. Ah. Yeah, it's also called the FT process for short. Basically, it's a way to create liquid fuels from coal or natural gas. Ah, okay. And it was crucial for Germany during the war because they didn't have enough natural oil. So they had to find a way to make their own. Makes sense. Right. And after the war, Corsi says these scientists were brought to the U.S. under Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip? It was this program that recruited German scientists and engineers. Interesting. Yeah, he believes they were brought over not just for their knowledge of synthetic fuels, but also for their understanding of abiotic oil. A secret the U.S. government wanted to keep under wraps, huh? <laughs> exactly. Wow. So, Pitchler, he was a member of the Nazi party, but later claimed he only joined out of fear. Oh, wow. That his real passion was his scientific work. Right. But Alberts, he was a much more dedicated Nazi. Hmm. Which probably made his entry into the U.S. a little more complicated. Yeah, he was initially denied entry, you know, because of his strong Nazi ties. But certain individuals within the U.S. government particularly those with commercial interests, argued his expertise was too valuable to lose. And those commercial interests won out, I'm guessing. They did. Alberts and his family were granted entry. Hmm. Makes you wonder what knowledge they had that was considered so valuable. Yeah. So one of the things that makes Corsi skeptical of the fossil fuel theory is its reliance on something called kerogen. Kerogen. Yeah, basically it's this complex organic substance found in sedimentary rocks. Okay. And it's considered the precursor to oil in the biotic theory. The missing link, so to speak. Kind of. Oh. But Corsi points out that kerogen has a very poorly defined chemical formula. So it's difficult to study. Right. It's hard to understand its exact role in oil formation. Huh. He sees this as a weakness in the biotic theory. 
arguing it's based on a substance we don't fully understand. Interesting. So what does he offer as an alternative? Well, he turns to the work of Thomas Gold. Thomas Gold. He was a renowned astronomer who championed the abiotic theory. Gold argued hydrocarbons aren't unique to Earth. Mm. They're abundant throughout the universe. He pointed to the presence of methane on other planets and moons, suggesting hydrocarbons can form in environments without any biological activity. Okay, I'm following. Now, one piece of evidence that Corsi finds particularly compelling is the findings of the Cassini-Huygens probe. Cassini-Huygens, remind me. It landed on Titan, Saturn's largest moon, back in 2005. Ah, right. And the probe found evidence of abundant methane on Titan. And given its super cold environment, it's unlikely that this methane is biological. Yeah, that makes sense. That finding definitely supports Gold's argument that hydrocarbons can form abiotically. Exactly. So what other evidence does Corsi present? Another study that caught his attention was conducted at the Lost City Hydrothermal Field. Lost City Hydrothermal Field. It's located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you know, that massive underwater mountain range. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. And scientists discovered hydrocarbons forming there in an environment with ultramafic rocks, water, and moderate heat. Ultramafic rocks. They're typically found deep in the Earth's mantle. Ah, okay. So their presence in this hydrothermal field suggests that these hydrocarbons could have originated deep within the Earth, not from biological sources near the surface. Interesting. Oh, and here's another fascinating tidbit. Okay, hit me. A 2011 study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It demonstrated how methane, the simplest hydrocarbon, can form larger hydrocarbon molecules under extreme pressure and heat. Like the conditions found in the Earth's upper mantle. Exactly. So, while it's not definitive proof of abiotic oil, this study does provide a plausible mechanism for how abiotic hydrocarbons could be created. Deep within the Earth, adding another layer of intrigue to the whole debate. I like it. Now, Corsi expresses frustration with the scientific community's resistance to embracing the abiotic theory. Really? He compares it to the resistance faced by scientists who propose revolutionary ideas in, uh, what's that book? Oh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Oh, I see where he's going with this. Kuhn's book is all about those moments when new discoveries challenge the prevailing scientific beliefs. Paradigm shifts. Exactly. And those shifts lead to major changes in how we understand the world. Big changes. Yeah, think of it like the shift from a geocentric model of the universe. Where everything revolves around the Earth. Right, to a heliocentric model where everything revolves around the sun. Those are paradigm shifts, and they definitely don't come easily. Corsi believes the abiotic theory of oil could be one of those paradigm-shifting ideas. And that the scientific community is sometimes too entrenched in the established theories to even consider alternative explanations. Even when presented with compelling evidence. Yeah, and honestly, I kind of see his point. Yeah, I mean, it's worth considering for sure. So Corsi's book is a great starting point, but there's more to the story. Yeah, there's more. Definitely. In the next part of our deep dive, we're going to explore evidence from some surprising places that might make you question everything you thought you knew about oil. Well, I am ready to be surprised. Let's do it. Okay, so stay tuned. Okay, so we're venturing beyond Corsi's book. Right, into the, the real world where evidence for abiotic oil gets even more interesting. Let's hear it. So, for starters, let's talk about the Kola Super Deep Borehole. The Kola Super Deep Borehole. Yeah, drilled by Russia way back in 1970. Okay. It reached a depth of over 7.6 miles into the Earth. 7.6 miles? That's insane. I know, right? And guess what they found at those depths? What? Water. And lots of it. Really? I thought it was impossible for water to exist that deep down. That's what everyone thought. <laughs> but the Cola Super Deep Borehole proved them wrong. Wow. So what else did they find down there? Well, along with the water, they found a bunch of hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas? Yeah, remember the fischer tropsch process we talked about earlier? Ah! Vaguely. Well, hydrogen is a key ingredient in creating hydrocarbons. Ah, I see. So finding it in such abundance deep underground, it really lends some weight to the idea that hydrocarbons could be forming down there. Okay, that's pretty compelling. Right. Now, another compelling case comes from the White Tiger oil field in Vietnam. White Tiger oil field. Yeah, it was drilled to a depth of 17,000 feet. Okay. And get this, it's producing oil from fractured basement rock. Basement rock. Yeah, it's the rock that lies beneath the sedimentary layers. Okay. And it's generally considered to be like empty of the organic matter that's supposed to be the source of oil, according to the biotic theory. So how are they finding oil there? 
Exactly. The fact that we're seeing oil production from this type of rock suggests it might be coming from somewhere deeper. Like abiotic processes happening in the Earth's mantle. You got it. And there's even evidence that some oil fields are refilling much faster than they should be, according to the traditional theory. Really? Yeah, it's called reservoir replenishment. Reservoir replenishment. Basically, it looks like these oil fields are being topped up from a deeper source. Which would make sense if oil is continuously being generated within the Earth. Right. It's like a constantly flowing underground well. Wow. Okay. I'm starting to see how this all fits together. Now let's move on to the Deccan Traps in India. Deccan Traps? Yeah, they're these huge volcanic basalt formations. Okay. They're known for having oil deposits, but here's the thing. What? They don't have the traditional source rocks. The ones rich in organic matter? Yep, the ones that are supposed to be associated with oil formation. So how is there oil there? That's the million dollar question. And it suggests that the oil in the decan traps could be abiotic, formed through processes related to the volcanic activity that created those basalt formations. Interesting, so are we seeing a pattern here? I think so. Yeah. Now let's shift gears to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. Yep. It's long been known for having occurrences of bitumen. Bitumen. It's a really thick, black, sticky form of petroleum. Okay, I've heard of it. And what's really fascinating is that there are all these historical accounts of this bitumen-like bubbling up from the seabed. Rising up from below. Yeah. And if those accounts are accurate, it would point to an abiotic source beneath the Dead Sea. Because it wouldn't be coming from decomposed organic matter in the sedimentary layers. Exactly. It would be coming from deeper down from within the earth. Okay, I see where you're going with this. And here's another piece of the puzzle. The correlation between seismic and volcanic activity and the location of hydrocarbon basins. Okay, explain that one to me. Well, for example, in Southeast Asia, in places like California, you see a lot of oil and gas deposits in areas with high seismic and volcanic activity. Hmm, interesting. Now, of course, correlation doesn't equal causation. Right, just because two things happen in the same place doesn't mean one caused the other. Exactly. But this correlation does raise some really interesting questions. Like? Like, could the Earth's internal processes, the same ones that drive earthquakes and volcanoes, also be involved in the formation and migration of hydrocarbons? Okay, now that's a thought-provoking idea. Right. And then there's the whole issue of methane hydrates. Methane hydrates. Yeah, those are vast deposits of methane trapped in ice-like structures at the bottom of the ocean. You're frozen methane. Pretty much. And it could be a huge source of natural gas. Okay, so how do they form? Well, the formation of methane hydrates doesn't necessarily need biological processes. Mm -hmm. Meaning it could be that abiotic methane rising up from the Earth's interior gets trapped in these ice formations. And as the ocean warms those methane hydrates could destabilize and release all that methane into the atmosphere. Which would be bad news for the climate. Definitely, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So it's like a ticking time bomb down there. Yeah, it's a little unsettling to think about. I know, but we have to face these challenges head on. You're right. So where do we go from here? So we've gone deep, haven't we? Yeah, pretty deep. From ancient seabeds to distant moons, exploring a theory that really challenges what we know about oil. We started off as these AIs, you know, investigating a conspiracy, an artificial oil scarcity, maybe. But we've stumbled upon a possibility that could change how we think about energy and even geopolitics. Yeah, so if abiotic oil is real and plentiful, does that mean we're not actually facing an energy crisis? Well, it's a tough question. No easy answers. If the abiotic theory holds up, it really changes how we view energy scarcity. Mm. Think about it. Vast, untapped reserves of oil right below us. It's a pretty amazing thought. But hold on. Even if oil is more abundant, shouldn't we still be concerned about the environmental impact? <laughs> Whether it's biotic or abiotic, extracting oil has consequences. Spills, habitat destruction, climate change. It's a lot. You're absolutely right. The source of the oil doesn't erase the environmental impact. And tapping into deep earth oil might even create new risks we haven't even thought of yet. Like what kind of risks? Well, think about it. Triggering seismic activity, releasing harmful gases from deep underground. We got to be really careful, do a lot of research before we jump into large scale deep earth oil extraction. And what about the politics and economics of it all? The world runs on oil. A shift to abiotic oil would disrupt everything. Yeah, it would be a huge shift, no doubt. Think about the impact on oil producing countries, energy companies, global markets. Power and wealth would be redistributed on a global scale. That's massive. Could there even be any positive outcomes from that kind of change? Oh, absolutely. Imagine a world where energy is more evenly distributed. 
Less dependence on a few big oil producers, lower energy costs. It could bring more economic stability, fewer geopolitical tensions, and greater access to energy for developing nations. It sounds almost too good to be true. But let's be realistic. A transition to abiotic oil wouldn't happen overnight. It would be a slow process with lots of technological, economic, and political hurdles. Definitely. And let's not forget the powerful interests that benefit from the current oil-based economy. They won't give up their power easily. I mean, look at the pushback against renewable energy like wind and solar. Shifting to abiotic oil would be a long, challenging road. So where does all this leave us? We started asking if there was an artificial oil scarcity and ended up exploring a theory that changes how we understand oil completely. We've looked at the evidence, explored the arguments, and thought about the potential consequences. Now it's up to you, our listener, to decide what you think. Do you stick with the traditional story of oil, or do you dig deeper, keep asking questions, maybe even be part of the movement that reshapes our energy future? This deep dive is just the beginning. There's a ton of information out there, research waiting to be done, debates to be had. Maybe you'll be the one to make the next big discovery, the one that changes everything. Keep questioning, stay curious, and never close your mind to new possibilities. And on that note, we'll leave you to ponder all of this. Until next time, happy diving.